out for you. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad we have these commentaries. We've waited for a long time to be able to build on a really solid foundation. And George, thank you. Your work has made that possible. Uh, I'd like to now turn to some of the uh, panelists, because if your reaction is like mine, there are many things here that seem perfectly familiar, and yet bafflingly strange. Or to quote in the Book of Moses, a strange thing is in the land. <laughs> but uh, let me turn first to Kent Brown, and uh, ask if Kent has a question, especially drawing out a lot of the things that he's been doing on the Book of Luke. Yes, um, I do. As a professor, uh, Nicholas Burke knows, my current passion is the Gospel of Luke. And there's one piece that I'd like to pick up. Um, the Chosen One is enthroned in First Enoch, chapter 61. In fact, there's mention of Chosen Ones in the plural. Likewise, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is called the Chosen One. As he hangs on the cross, his detractors come and say uh, something to the effect, he saved others, let him save himself, and come down, if he be the Christ, the chosen one. Now it's not just on the lips of his detractors, but also from, from the Father on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the bright cloud comes over the three apostles, they hear the voice of God, uh, which says, This is my beloved Son, hear him. But the best Greek texts say, This is my chosen Son, hear him. The plural, the many chosen ones, is also preserved in a saying of Jesus right at the end of the parable of the um, unjust judge, when Jesus says, uh, shall not God avenge his elect who cry unto him day and night? Uh, so there, there we see the chosen one is the title for Jesus, and also chosen ones, the elect, uh, who are his followers. So, do you see connections? Well, yeah, no, I, are we on? Let me yes. stand up. Let me, yeah. uh, let me stand up here, this is better. Um, yeah, I, I, I puzzled over those texts. Luke is my favorite gospel. It's the only one I ever did classes on. I was afraid of John, and I just never, <laughs> and I just never, I never, ta I never tackled um, Matthew. But Luke was always the one I liked most for who knows what reasons. And I, I was struck by the use of the term "chosen one" precisely in the places that you talk about. Now, as I mentioned, there were four, there are three titles. Was the Son of Man. Well, actually four. There's the Righteous One, the Chosen One, the Son of Man, and the Anointed One. Now, the Anointed One is the Messiah, okay? So uh, what, what the author of the parables has done is he's taken four different titles. One is a Messianic title. One is a title. Two of them are titles. The Righteous One, Chosen One are titles of the Servant of the Lord. And one is the Son of Man. And he's embodied them all in one figure. So when it says, if he is the chosen one, what are the exact words? If he's the chosen one, the King of Israel, is that what it is? Yeah. If he is the Christ, the chosen one. If he is the Christ, the chosen one. That is it bringing together the Messiah, Messianic title and the chosen one, which two titles are coming together here. I think what the... Uh, what the uh, what the author of the parables is doing is he's turning titles about a, he's combining title about a, a Davidic king together with the servant on the Lord. What Matthew, what Luke is doing is he's taking these two titles and applying them to a to a human being, and he's saying, now look, you know, if this guy is really the Messiah, the chosen one, the servant of the Lord, then let, let him do the big trick and come down from the doors. Of course, if he does that, he proves he's the wrong kind of Messiah. So he's in a, he's in a double mind at this particular point. But I think the question you're raising, I can answer by saying that I think servant language, the chosen one, which I think is probably the preeminent title for the Son of Man in the parables, actually. 
that these two titles are brought together already in Jewish tradition in a very different sense. I mean, this is an exalted one. But yeah, I, and, and there are other things about the, the Gospel of Luke that I won't take any time to go through here that I think tie in with tie in with the Book of Phoenix. Yeah, and this is a case where you take a, a Jewish pseudepigraphic text and can see it as a filter through which to see or a grid through which to see New Testament stuff. Because after all, the New Testament is a Jewish text. Yes, uh, any comment on that? How would you answer your own question? Well, I think I think that Luke and the author of uh, these book of parables are in effect drinking from the same stream. And I agree with uh, Professor Nicholsburg that uh, the inspiration for this really rises out out of uh, Isaiah 42, where this, this are, title, "Behold, my servant, my chosen, in whom my soul delights," which yeah. is language also from the baptismal story and, mm -hmm. and more and so forth. Yeah, it's coming out of Isaiah 42, 1, which is one of the servant texts, Isaiah 48. Yeah, 48 is another Deuteronomic text. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and then we get the, uh, Isaiah 52, 53, but that's too complicated to go into. But yeah, no, these are servant, these are servant, uh, these are echoes of the servant song, the second Isaiah, right? Sure. Uh, Bill Hamlin has uh, authored a book, co-authored, uh, books on the temple. And Bill, I'm curious what you might have to say about all this temple imagery and all these different temples that we've encountered in this uh, grand tour of Phoenix. Uh, well, I love it. Uh, first, let me say that I've admired Professor Nicholsburg's scholarship uh, for many years, and especially his monumental com commentary on First Unique, as well as his numerous other studies. And we're very fortunate to have one of the world's leading Phoenix scholars here to address us at BYU, and I very much enjoyed your remarks. I'd um, just like to raise an issue here and you know, get your reaction to these uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, you know that the, there are uh, different sections in the Book of Enoch discuss three earthly temples, the, or three temples, the earthly, the celestial, and the eschatological, and that Enoch ascended to the celestial temple to receive his divine commission. And, and then you said this is in somewhat in contrast to the experiences of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and other biblical prophets. And I, I kind of perceive this a little differently. I think they're complementary, that they're more overlapping. And I'll just give a couple of examples of why and then I'd like to get your uh, reaction to that. For, in, uh, in the Bible we have both Micaiah in 1 Kings uh, 22 and Jeremiah in Jeremiah 23 who claim to have stood in the divine council. This is the soul or the adat of, of the Lord. And I think to me this, this means uh, that from these related passages the divine council meets before God in the throne room of God, which is in the celestial temple. And thus I think it's implicit here that both Micaiah and Jeremiah claim to have ascended into heaven and to have been commissioned by God before his throne in his heavenly temple. And to me, this, this parallels Enoch and reflects the same type of thing that Enoch is claiming, although in much, much less detail. It's more implied here. I think minimally this, this could be how Enochian Jews, that is, Jews who read and, and accepted first Enoch, might have understood those passages. Uh, Isaiah 6 is, is somewhat puzzling in that regard. Uh, the fundamental question to me is, does Isaiah's vision of God, seated on his throne in the Holy of Holies, occur in the earthly temple or in the heavenly temple? And, or perhaps for Isaiah, those two places overlap and merge together. In other words, did entering the Holy of Holies during earthly rituals signify entering the presence of God in the celestial temple? Uh, in either event, we have Isaiah having a divine commission through a throne theophany, which plausibly could have been understood by Isaiah and his contemporaries as occurring in the celestial temple. Um, Ezekiel's an, an, an interesting case too, because there, instead of Ezekiel ascending to the celestial temple to stand before the throne of God, God's throne comes down comes to, to Ezekiel, 
which may imply even a greater authority. Enoch had to go up to heaven to meet God, but God comes down to meet Ezekiel. But again, it's a, it's a throne uh, theophany in that regard. So um, to me, I see these types of uh, descriptions in the Bible as complementing and you know, intersecting with Enoch's um, celestial uh, so I uh, said to the throne of God in the, in the celestial temple, rather than as contrasting with them. So I'm just like the reaction. To that. Yeah, you're pick, you're picking <laughs> you're you're picking on one sentence in my in my thing. Um, no, yes. Uh, first, first of all, first of all, Enoch ascends to heaven in a dream vision. Okay, you, you just really normally do not think about. We run over those things. He's going to heaven in a dream. I mean, it's clearly it's a it's a dream vision. He's just, he he prays until he dozes and goes to sleep, and then he has the the vision, the dream, and he goes up and he has the vision. But he's still got his feet on earth. And uh, yeah, this is tr this is tricky stuff. How many of us have had a dream that is so real that as you're trailing out of it, you would swear that you were in that place? But it happens to us all the time. We are in the place. And so it's not surprising that Enoch is in the place when he's sleeping down by the waters of, of, of Dan. So when I say he went up, he went up in a dream vision. Um, and it's the same thing, I think, in the animal vision. It's a, it's a dream. The, the word is actually dream that is used. Um, I have a little, a little trouble with Isaiah because he sees the feet of God. And it's, it's like God is up there and his feet are down there. And I have the impression that Isaiah is really saying that he's, that he's on, on earth. When I was talking about Jeremiah, I was really talking about Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1, where he has his, where he has his, his call, where he is on, clearly on earth. And, uh, but I hadn't been thinking about the one that you mentioned about being in the divine. I, yeah, I don't know. You're down here, you're up there, and so forth. And complementary two sides of the same coin, I think so. Um, the closest parallel between uh, Enoch's ascent to heaven, quote unquote, in chapter 14 is uh, Ezekiel. It's clearly that. Uh, you've seen the charts in my commentary, and the parallels are just stunning but, but it is interesting as as you say and as i think i say in my commentary that uh that uh, ezekiel is down here the throne comes down here and enoch at this point he's got to go up he's got to go up there the, the the lord of spirits or the great holy one as he's called in the early parts does not come down to earth there is one passage somewhere that says he's going to come down and sit on top of a mountain, and the mountain is his, is his throne. But the kind of heavy apocalypticized language that we get in chapters 14 to 16 do not allow for a deity to come down to earth, as is Ezekiel. But you know something I, I've never... I don't know whether anybody has ever done a good, let's call it anthropological study, of the relationship between uh, visions, calls, if you want to call it that, and the Hebrew Bible and the kind of stuff we're talking about here. I'm not sh so sure they are terribly different from one another in concrete reality. If we sat next to the guy here and watched what was going on, I'm not so sure that they are terribly different. We make these distinctions all the time, and as I say, I think that in the language of, of Enoch, He's got to go up. God doesn't come down. And that is different from, from Ezekiel. But I, I don't know if we got into the reality of it. We really sat down next to these guys you know, and then talked to them afterwards. With it. What would be the difference? I, I just don't know. And I appreciate what you're saying. I'm sure that they are. They are complementary with some distinctions. Yeah. Does that help? Uh, Gordon? Gordon Thompson? Question or comment on first thing I was going to say. Yes, I want to do one. Thank you. 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 Thank
enjoy the session of corporate uh, ideas by many. Uh, the big secret is that we were also up at uh, Utah State on Tuesday, and so this is a continuation of the discussion uh, that really began with him there. Uh, and my question takes granted as certain aspects of the conversation that have already taken place. But I really want to start with uh, Jared Ludlow's introduction, in which he mentioned something which you know, raised a few eyebrows or generated a few question marks about the Enoch Seminar, which is a biannual seminar for uh, professionals. Uh, there's also a level for graduate students and such uh, at a different time uh, studying the Enoch tradition. Uh, at a very sophisticated professional level. And uh, the fact that unique studies are taking place uh, is, I suspect, news to most Latter-day Saints, but uh, it's something that uh, bears watching, we might say. We need some watchers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and holy one. Yes, that's <laughs> Almost. <laughs> anyway. Uh, the question which I had uh, is uh, slightly different tenor. Uh, we have this ongoing institution, the Enix Seminar. Uh, personally, from your own reading, your own studies, your own uh, professional productions, and watching what other people are doing, uh, what aspects of temple studies or perspectives from ritual or litur litur liturgical studies uh, can you see which uh, other professionals might pursue? Uh, Speaking myself, having retired a little while ago, I know that uh, priorities change uh, with retirement. But uh, what what uh, flares what might you send along the path for others to uh, to follow? Uh, with regard to the unique tradition and temple studies oh, together. That isn't what you said before you were going to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, what you, what you said before you were going to ask me is what direction should the Enoch Seminar go, and I was going to ask you whether this was being sent to the people who run the Enoch Seminar, seminar, seminary, se seminar. <laughs> but that's what you asked me before. Now, now you're asking me really a very different question, which is the question of, of, of temple studies and Enoch, and I'm not sure. While you're thinking about that, let me just remind you that although we're in the moot courtroom, due process and notice rules don't apply. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken well by a lawyer. <laughs> Now you're asking a temple question, which is which is a, a, a different kind of question, and maybe as I talk along, I'll figure out how it how it how it relates to to Enoch. But um, if we're talking about temple studies, um, and about which I know nothing, absolutely nichts. Okay, um, it seems to me that it would be very useful to try to compare what was going on in the Israelite shrines, and let's say the, the Israelite temples, and what was going on in other non-Israelite temples, an awful lot of which we have to say, to talk about structure. I mean, how the things were built. And as some of us were talking at various times over these last three days, which are a total blur in my own mind right now. Um, there are huge rings, of, not rings, rows of temples along the valley opposite Mount Hermon, which are temples of the Eterians, who were, uh, I guess, a Semitic, a Semitic group of people who lived in the Greco-Roman period which, as far as I know, have never really been studied. A couple of them have been excavated, but not a great deal. And uh, the, the, the ridge of the Lebanon mountains and the anti-Lebanon mountains, the, the highest part of which is Mount Hermon, um, stand opposite one another. And this is obviously holy ground. And uh, I 
you know, I defer to my archaeological friends, of whom I have a few, uh, as to what one could be learned from this and how we would tie in uh, Israelite temples with those. Then there is the whole question of Herod's temple. There is the question of these pagan temples that Herod built out on Caesarea, and they built another one on, on Mount Hermon on, um, at, at Caesarea Philippi. And so I don't know to what extent. It, it seems to me that, ant that uh, archaeological study would be one way to go about it. Then one would have to talk about what went on in there, and then we'd have to figure out where we could get that kind of information. There are Greek temples uh, all over the Mediterranean world. And um, I think Jack was talking before about a paper that, uh, that Jonathan Z. Smith gave on, on how there ought to be canons, but we have to compare canons with canons. If you're going to do Bible, you're supposed to do Buddhist, um, Buddhist studies as well. And we, we live in a, in a world where you can't. You can't be isolated in what you look at because we know there's all sorts of stuff going back and forth. So I would think interdisciplinary, first in terms of archaeology and text studies and anthropology and whatever else we can do. Second of all, crossing over religious lines. Uh, as far as Enoch is concerned, now I've been treading water long enough on this thing, is, is whether we can say anything at all about the shape of, say the shape, about the, about the description of Enoch's temple up there and the Jerusalem temple, which was the obvious um, counterpart to it. I always feel that if you're going to compare things, you should compare the things that are closest together before you start going too far out, because that's just logically people didn't have jet planes in those days, and we didn't have television and so forth. So you have to start out the closest up. So what is the relationship between... Um, between the temple up there and the, and the phenomena, the phenomenal temples that were on Earth, how does this, how might this compare to the temple in Elephantini? How does this compare to the shrine? There is a shrine up in Dan. There's a massive, massive temple up in Dan, right, right now. The, the temple's here, and right down there is the water of Dan, and the, the, there sits, there sits Enoch, uh, listening to the white water and trying to, trying to go up to heaven. So I think broadly as possible, and. Uh, yeah, it's very hard because Enoch is an apocalyptic text. It's not Josephus. It's not Philo, who sometimes gives us some great descriptions. It's not Strabo. It's none of these people. It's a, it's a, it's a text of a totally different order. And so then the question is, how can, you, how can you compare? Just as we were talking a moment ago about visions, how do you compare uh, a, a prophetic text of the what is it, 8th century? Isaiah, with, uh, with the text of the, of the third century. And what are the worlds in which they are? And how do you, how do you bring pears and apples and, and oranges and dox hunts together and try to, you know, try to say something intelligible about them? I, so I, I think go as broadly as possible, go cross-disciplinary with archaeology, with anthropology, with exegesis, with philology, the whole business, and then see where you come out uh, in the century after next. <laughs> Good question, Gordon. Looks like we've got lots more work to do. Uh, but. Um, you know, when you say be as broad as possible, we're going to take a 10 minute break and then come back to talk about uh, something maybe off the charts as far as broad is concerned, and that's the uh, book of Enoch in uh, the Pearl of Great Price, uh, which also can be comparing. All right, let's compare and see what that.